So welcome to what you should know about the care and keeping of your ileal conduit, a chat with the experts. This is a patient insight webinar from the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. My name is Stephanie Chisholm, and I'm the Director of Education and Research here at Beacon. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Estella Seattle Genetics Partnership, Crystal Myers Squibb, the EMD Serono Pfizer Partnership, Genentech, Janssen Oncology, Merck, and PhotoCure for their support of the Patient Insight webinar series. You know that bladder cancer is a devastating disease with an estimated more than 80,000 new patients expected to be diagnosed each year. For some patients, removing the bladder is the standard of care that offers their best prognosis. Today's program will focus on one of the common urinary diversions, the ileal conduit. Again, my name is Stephanie Chisholm, and I'm joined today by Jocelyn Goffman, a wound anatomy expert from the Houston Methodist Hospital, along with two of our Beacon patient advocates, Daryl and Ann, who will share their experiences with the care and keeping of ileal conduits. Ms. Goffney is a wound and ostomy incontinence nurse at Methodist Hospital in Houston, Texas. She's the program leader for this department and is responsible for assessing the needs, strategic planning, and coordination care for patients with wounds, ostomies, and continence issues. Additionally, she's responsible for providing staff education and serves on committees for the development of policies and procedures in the areas of wounds, ostomies, and continence. Welcome, Jocelyn. It's nice to have you with us. Thank you. Nice to be here. And then we also have two of our patient advocates, Daryl Nakagawa. Daryl, I'm so sorry, I screwed up your name, is an experienced continuous improvement leader with decades of experience transforming corporations in different industries. He's quite the Renaissance man. Daryl originally was destined for the operatic stage and has appeared with national and international stars on several PBS great performance broadcasts in Hawaii, Houston, and Cincinnati. And since his diagnosis in May of 2017, he's really continued to live a very active life. And I'm really excited to have Daryl on board because he was diagnosed with T2 bladder cancer and had his bladder removed. In May. So I think that there's a lot that you're going to be able to contribute. So welcome, Daryl. It's nice to have you here. Thanks, Stephanie. Great to be here. And Anthro spent many years in non okay. <clears throat> with the Bureau of Prisons and retired from the U.S. Army. She was deployed four times to combat bat zones. And while there, she began to take up ballroom dancing as a way of challenging all of the stress of being in combat in Iraq. So Anne was diagnosed with a rare form of bladder cancer and she had her bladder removed with an ileal conduit six months before competing in the first pro-am ballroom dancing competition for the amateur dancer in Blackpool, England in 2017. So Anne, it's nice to have you with us. Some of the people who've been on other programs and read other documents from Beacon have already met you in our newsletters, but thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. Who's going to start talking about the radical cystectomy with an ileal conduit? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to be here. This is a very informal webinar and just to give you information to make you feel a little more comfortable. <clears throat> there are at least 1.7 million people in the United States or the world who basically live an active life after having an ostomy. I put the GU system up here because sometimes we just forget about how our body functions. We have the kidney, which the ureters are connected into, which goes into the bladder, which then goes into the urethra. Okay. After you have an ileal conduit or a urostomy, and you'll hear those two terms interchanged um, a lot. Basically, the bladder is then removed, um, and then you a small segment of the colon of the small intestinal tract, the ileum. And sometimes, and it hasn't been in a long time, they use the colon, but mainly your small intestinal tract um, is used. And this piece is used as the conduit for the urine to pass 
out of your body. The ureters, you can go next, Stephanie. Next, next slide. As you see, the bladder is gone. The ureters are then connected into the small intestinal tract, the ileum, and that is the way the urine basically flows out into a pouch. Um, this is called the urinary diversion, but most terms you'll hear will be ileoconduit or urostomy. So those are the three terms that you'll often hear um, when we talk about urinary types of diversion. Next. The main thing that patients want to know when coming um, to see me preoperatively is basically, <clears throat> how do I know or where do you know where to place it? Where is it going to be? A lot of patients think that basically it is going to be on their side, on their back. But basically, it's normally on the right hand side right around the umbilicus or right below it. It depends on basically if you are short-waisted or you're a little taller. We come to the fact of kind of where to put it by having you look at critical points on your abdomen. <clears throat> the stoma is usually constructed over the abdominal muscle. It gives it support when the physician brings the stoma up. We have you to stand, to bend, and then we look and see, basically, is there any scarring? Is there basically anything that would basically not provide a good fit for your stoma? The questions that are often asked again, and now we're at patient education, is, you know, how do I contain it? What do I do? And so we tell you, basically, to empty, you consider stand. We tell you to empty when it's about one third or a half full. There are containment devices, which you'll see a picture of a little later. And most of your pouches have an anti-reflux valve. That means that when it flows into the pouch, it won't flow back up. And you normally change it every three to five days. Anna or Daryl, would you like to add anything to that? I would just add that when you're very active, you may have to change it more frequently. Mm -hmm. okay. So you might Alrighty. have to change it every couple days or depending on your activity level. Okay. But typically and they, three to five is a good gauge. Okay. And so you found three to five works very well. And that's kind of a guideline. And I just want to let everybody know that basically when we teach or we give information, it is a guideline. Your care will be specific to you. Normally, when we start out, we teach survival skills, and that's basically how to measure your stoma, how to basically apply the pouch to stay dry. And then we gradually work your way up to teaching you other survival skills so that basically you'll know how to manage your appliance. And, and you may notice when it is getting close to time to change. So what I notice is, and, and what we may touch upon this later, is I have an increase of mucus um, in the liquid. So I know it's getting close to time to change. And there occasionally are seasonal differences. I can typically go longer um, okay. In summer versus winter. Yes. Um, if you are a person that sweats or perspires, if you are a person that works outside a lot, basically your wear time will decrease. There are changes in signs with the appliance that will also let you know that it's possibly time to change it. Um, Again, everybody's different, and those are some really good thoughts. If you perspire a lot, if you're very active, uh, if you're outside a lot, you probably will have to change your appliance a lot more frequent than normal. Next.
I stress to my patients, basically, when we talk about how am I going to care for this, we talk about common uh, problems that will happen. This is called a peristomal um, skin damage because basically you did not get a good seal. That is a typical stoma that you're looking at there. It is moist. It is red. Interesting, it has no nerve endings, but it has a good blood supply. One of the complications that we also talk about is if your stoma starts turning dark, then the blood supply has been compromised, and that is a call that should be made to your physician. The reason why there is, again, peristomal irritation, it's either there's a poor seal. That means that the pouch is not fitting properly. It can be either that you're making the opening of the appliance too large or that you need to make a modification to your appliance. Um, that's often done. Probably you'll find some of these complications in the first couple of months as you are basically getting accustomed um, to the appliance. But it's, it's always important, basically, that if you start leaking, and sometimes it's the misnomer that you tape it. We don't teach taping. You have to start over. You take the appliance off, and you reapply the appliance. Because basically, if you don't, what you're doing is trapping the urine under your skin. And there's a picture next that will show you basically what happens if you trap it. And this is pseudoverrucous lesion. That means that there's a lot of leakage on the skin. So you get the skin reacting. It's like, I'm going to protect myself because this urine is constantly bathing um, my skin. Basically, how we treat this, again, is proper fitting of the appliance around the stoma, vinegar soap, and basically, um, they will use a stick, something called silver nitrate. It's like we have to re-injure the skin, basically, to decrease those, that hypergranulation tissue around um, the stoma. Some people yeah. also use wipes, um, but um, you have to be um, cautious that the wipes don't affect the adhesive um, on the actual wafer. Mm -hmm. um, you're absolutely correct, Daryl. Basically, what I teach, uh, or what we mainly teach is, nothing that has an emollient on it. And basically, we just teach cleaning with plain water, just plain tap water around there. We're usually creatures of habit, and so even the mildest of soaps, if you're not careful, um, basically, you can trap and so that residue underneath your pouch, and then you'll get skin irritation um, occurring on that. And so and, basically, mm -hmm. go ahead, that, that would include soaps like um, Dove or Tone or whatnot that have moisturizers in it. So plain ivory would be yes. best. And even with the plain ivory, we basically just caution you to really, really, really clean and make sure there's still no soap residue. That's when my patients really get into trouble is when they don't rinse that area really, really well. And so they get like a skin dermatitis or an irritation um, on the skin. Next. Some of the other complications that will sometimes happen is a peristolial hernia. And that's basically... You have to remember that when you're in surgery, basically, they sometimes cut through the muscle. Um, and as we age, basically, everything kind of gets weaker. And so a peristomal hernia will sometimes occur with our patients. Prolapse will sometimes occur and a retracted stoma. There are appliances that basically we use to help with all of these. 
Physicians normally will not treat surgically um, because we, again, have appliances that can basically help with the hernias, with the prolapse, uh, and with the retracted stomas. The only time normally they'll take you back to surgery if there is a decrease in the urine production. And that is when they will consider basically um, taking you back to surgery to correct uh, these entities, these problems. And I live with uh, peristomal hernia um, day by day. So um, um, we'll talk about this later. Um, I use a stealth belt to help protect it and support it. Yes, there is a stealth belt and there are hernia belts by other companies and we will show you guys um, that. And then also for the prolapse, for the retracted stoma, basically there is convex uh, appliances and things that we basically use um, to help with that. Next. 